This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to uh, the first night in this next series of UCSF Mini Medical School. Um, welcome back to um, our returners and welcome uh, to the new learners. Uh, we are very excited about this course. You know, the super big picture overview is where we'll actually consider um, a doctor and a patient and then look into the science of the immune system, what drugs may be involved, and the genetics um, underpinning these sort of um, disorders. So we're very excited, and we hope you are too. So that's sort of the household um, announcements, and then I'm going to introduce to you um, Dr. Gundling. Um, she is an associate clinical professor of allergy and immunology here at UCSF. She's the practice chief of the allergy immunology clinic at Moffitt Hospital. Um, she did her undergraduate at Stanford, then um, worked for several years in the medical legal arena, and um, then went to uh, get her medical degree at the University of Rochester. She was the director of medical education at UC Davis for eight years. Um, and is the recipient of numerous teaching awards, and tonight you will see why that is. Um, she is well known for her work with residents and students, and um, has also been, been involved in um, writing and studying uh, the impact of alternative um, medicine. And um, I will not take up any more of your time, but would like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Gundling. Thank you so much. All right, good evening, everybody. And welcome to not only our mature learners, but also to our super young learners as well. It's so exciting to have a broad range of ages in our audience tonight. My name is Catherine Gundling, and it's my privilege and honor to have you as a semi-captive audience for the next 90 minutes to learn a little bit about the immune system and also to learn a little bit about what it's like to have a problem with the immune system. So why don't we just go ahead and get started. So tonight's presentation will be three parts. The first part will be reviewing the basic concepts of the immune system. And our learning goal for this first part will be to describe the essential purposes of the immune system. In the second part of our talk tonight, we will meet Elizabeth. And our goal in meeting Elizabeth is really to learn what it's like firsthand, what it's like living with a problem with the immune system, because there's no better way to remember it than to meet someone who has it. You know, you think that you give these amazing lectures or talks when you're teaching medical students, but I remember when I was a medical student, most of those faces of the teachers are long gone. What I remember is the patients that they brought to the class and what they said about what it was like to have the illness and things that they could or couldn't do. And to this day, I remember them very clearly. And so I think you're probably, although I didn't tell her that, I think you're probably going to remember Elizabeth for a long, long time after today. The third part of our talk will be to apply Elizabeth's story, what has happened with her, to our newfound knowledge of the immune system. And the learning goal here is to understand which part of her immune system is not working quite right. And of course, no class would be complete without learning some essential vocabulary words. So you'll get a little bit of vocabulary along the way, and your new vocabulary words will be in this sort of bright orange. 
Okay? All right, so that's the order of the evening. Now, usually if you're trying to understand something or solve a mystery, you sort of think of, let's go to the basics, who, what, where, when, why, and how. So we'll do something like that tonight, only not quite in that order. We'll just mix it up a little bit. And first, we're going to address why. Why do we have an immune system? I'd like for anybody to tell me, what do we need an immune system for? Anybody? Here's a, a hand up there. Yes, to fix whatever's wrong. I love that broad answer. So basically, immunologists know and do everything, right? <laughs> so that's not quite right, but sometimes we like to think so. Yes. Yeah, to protect us from foreign substances. So there are a lot of external threats that we can have that we're exposed to, and the body, the immune system, has to decide, is this dangerous and what do I need to do about it? So name for me some type of external threat. Bacteria, perfect, yeah. Viruses. Viruses, yeah. So infections. So infections are one of the main reasons we have an immune system to protect us from that. And I've got some cool slides of pictures of things that like to threaten us. In the upper left-hand corner is a picture of E. coli. You've probably heard about E. coli if you're unfortunate enough to eat a piece of contaminated meat. You can get a very severe infection with E. coli. And if you're very young or very old, you're even susceptible to death with infection with E. coli. More commonly, it causes bladder infections. But it can wreak a lot of havoc in the body. In the upper right is anthrax. And many of you, maybe not the youngest of you, remember not too long after 9-11, somebody was mailing anthrax, of all things, in envelopes or packages to other people. Why would you do this? Inhalation of anthrax can be very deadly. I'm not sure that mystery was ever solved, was it? Um, in any case, um, anthrax is another example of an external threat. It's a different kind of organism. And Helicobacter pylori down at the bottom is an example of an organism, or we sometimes say bug, that sometimes can live in humans quite happily and don't really bother us. In some cases, they may even actually help us. But if you've never been exposed to it before and you get an infection with Helicobacter pylori, you can also get, guess what, an ulcer. And it causes ulcers in the upper part of the bowel, in the small intestine. And the scientists who discovered this, no one believed them. Because remember, 25 years ago, everybody thought ulcers was due to stress, right? So patients with ulcers got referred to the psychiatrist. So the guy who recognized this had to get a cup of Helicobacter pylori and drink it and prove that it caused ulcers, which it did. And I believe he won a big prize for having demonstrated that. So let's look at examples of other external threats. Pollution. All different kinds of pollution can really startle the immune system and make it go into action. OK? So if you inhale a lot of polluted particles, the immune system has to respond to that. And sometimes it will do it very vigorously in a way that might actually be harmful for the body. But it's the immune system that responds to the pollution that we inhale, even when we're driving cars and we breathe exhaust. OK. You may or may not believe this one. Is it possible that this cute kitty cat or this dog might be a threat to you? Yes. OK. How, and how can, how can exposure to these cute animals cause problems? So hay fever type symptoms, allergic rhinitis, asthma type symptoms. I have a friend who wound up in the intensive care unit. He was so allergic to cats. And needless to say, they were unable to keep their cat, which was a big tragedy. But this is just to let you know that sometimes furry, warm little packages can actually be a bit of a threat to the immune system. So this actually brings up a really important question. Why would the immune system even care about warm, furry little bodies? And this is a very important question. And it's actually the subject of our first vocabulary word. And that is tolerance, OK? Bright orange tolerance, that's our vocabulary word. The immune system has to decide what's friend and what's foe. OK? So if your immune system is freaking out around cat dander or dust mites or a little bit of pollen, 
that's not necessarily the reaction that you want your immune system to have, right? Your immune system should say, eh, cat dander, who cares, and move along, and worry about something like anthrax, right? You want your immune system to be focused correctly on the things that are dangerous to you. So tolerance is very important, and it's the subject of much ongoing scientific investigation right now. How does any individual's immune system decide what to tolerate and what to be aware of? what to freak out about. It doesn't really freak out too often, though. It's usually pretty controlled. So there actually are some internal threats that we need to think about with respect to immunity as well. And here's one of them. Cancer can be a problem with the immune system. You'll notice in orange our next vocabulary word, which is apoptosis. Now, some people say apoptosis. And you got to admit, it's a lot more fun to say apoptosis than apoptosis. But really, apoptosis is programmed cell death. And you see here in this slide that a normal cell that is born will divide and do its normal work and whatever it's supposed to do. And then when its time is done and it's done all its work, it kind of nicely involutes and does a nice little implosion, if you will. It's very neat and tidy. And the immune system cleans that up. So when this cell is done with cell death there, then you have this process of apoptosis. And it's a nice, orderly, internal way that the immune system cleans up things that are no longer needed inside the body. When this doesn't work right, these cells just keep replicating and replicating and replicating. And what's it called when you have cells that are replicating uncontrollably? Cancer, OK? So a problem with programmed cell death is one reason that we can get cancer, Okay, failure of programmed cell death. So that's one very important part of the immune system is to perform apoptosis and make sure that all the normal processes of the body occur in the proper fashion. Now, there's another role of the immune system internally that I want to remind you about, and that's just promotion of normal bodily function where, let's say, you get a cut on your skin. Why is it that you heal up? It's because you have an immune system that's functioning. Okay, If you didn't have an immune system, that cut, even a small cut, could potentially become quite infected and kill you. But it doesn't. All of you have had small cuts or even large cuts. And in general, the immune system is very good at wound repair and tissue cleanup. So these are just some examples of the sort of broad variety of actions of the immune system. And most of us know about and focus upon infections. And that's certainly very, very important. But there are many other activities. Now, if you did not have an immune system, what would happen to you? Well, within a very short period of time, you would probably get eaten up. And you would dry up and you would blow away. Okay. Now, if you were lucky enough to be living in the highlands of Peru and you were very important, someone might mummify you so that you could be found relatively intact many hundreds of years later. But for most of us, we would really disintegrate quite quickly and become part of this, which I saw a picture of when I was at a meeting in San Antonio last week. And that is the great dust storm of 1938 in Texas. And they had a picture there, and I thought it was just amazing. And mostly, you know, if our immune systems do not work, we die. We be go, go back to the earth and we become part of dust. So on that humbling note, let's move on. <laughs> OK, where is the immune system? OK, we've learned a little bit about the immune system and why we have it. But where is it located? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah, a lot of different places. And we've already got some hints. And one hint is the fact that the immune system needs to protect us from external threats, right? So it would make sense that much of the immune system is in the border between the outside world and the inside world. And here is a good example of that. Okay? This little child might be doing something related to gums. But in fact, this kid is training his immune system. Okay? And that is not a sterile item. We don't sterilize our breakfast before we eat it. Right? So everything that we put in our mouths likely to have some kind of dust or dirt or bacteria or viruses. But it doesn't bother us. We don't die by noontime because of infection. right? So our immune systems know what to do with things that 
sorry, I keep bumping this, the things that go into the mouth or things that we inhale. So much of the immune system is very close to the outside world to be able to process things that we might swallow or that we might inhale. But there's something else about this kid that's really important that you can see uh, most of the screen. And that's his skin, you are right. The skin is a very important barrier between the outside world and the inside world, okay? So what do we need to know about that? Very briefly, and then we'll come back to it a little bit more later. The skin, if, I, if you have a cut and you were to sort of slice it on the side, looking at it from the side, here's the top of the skin, and here are the deeper layers of the skin. And in this particular picture, I think the author actually was trying to point out the vasculature. So you have an artery that supplies blood to the areas of the skin, and you have in blue here the vein where the blood comes back. But what you can see, and what my super IT guy added, is lymph vessels. And that's this yellow thing right here. So that when you cut your skin, there are a whole bunch of immune cells that are underneath the skin. And they're kind of standing guard, standing sentry, just looking out for trouble. And when they see trouble, they communicate via these lymphatic vessels to cells deeper down. Okay, so that's one example of how the immune system catches what's going on from the outside world that manages to get inside. Okay, here's for the teenager. This is your toughest question of the night. What is this? It is a foot. You are right. <laughs> okay, so, but when I look at this, I see the immune system. That is a really good looking foot, okay? It's important to recognize that all over our skin, we have healthy bacteria that help to protect us, okay? Healthy bacteria all over the skin of our body. So that if there are bad bacteria that we come in contact with, they have to compete with all the good bacteria. And you can be sure that if you did not have healthy skin, you did not have those normal good bacteria, that you could have some really gnarly athlete's feet and even worse, okay? So that's a healthy foot, but it also, um, helps us to understand that the outside of the skin is also an important part of the immune system with competitive bacteria, all right? So all that said, that sounds a little confusing, but in fact, there are some areas of the immune system to focus on where there's actually more immune activity. So let's take a look at the lymphatic system. You'll notice it's in what color? Orange, okay, so vocabulary word, vocabulary term. The lymphatic system is really where you have major sites of immune activity. And here are just a few of them. You're familiar with your tonsils, right? If you have, especially when you're a kid, you have those big old tonsils in there. That's a good thing. If you see a small child who is lacking tonsils, that's a bad thing. Why? Because tonsils are lymph tissue. Tonsils are specifically loaded with B lymphocytes that help to provide protection to that child and help that child's immune system to grow. But as you all know, tonsils can cause problems too if they get infected too often or have other problems. So the tonsils are an example of lymph tissue. I'll mention the thymus a little bit later, but basically that's a gland right behind the breastbone that's large when we're little, and it gets little when we grow large is an easy way to remember it. The spleen, which is generally a little bit larger than might be shown there, is under the rib cage on the left. And any of you teenagers, have you had to get the meningitis vaccine yet? There's a meningitis vaccine, which a lot of you get when you go to college, for this organism called meningococcus. And meningococcus is one of the organisms that if you do not have a spleen, you are particularly susceptible to dying from meningococcal meningitis. And so that's why many of you are vaccinated before you go to college, because that's a place where people tend to get exposed to that organism. The spleen is important because it is really good at filtering bacteria out of the blood. It filters organisms out of the blood in a very efficient manner, whereas some things that we'll look at later are more designed for tissue sites as opposed to screening blood. And then we talked about the, the gut, and there are some lymph nodes called Peyer's patches in, in the gut, and that's the center of lymph activity because we eat every day three meals. That's a lot of mm, bacteria, viruses, things from the outside world that we ask the gut to process. So it needs to know what to do. And in fact, the gut is the largest immune organ in the body. Tons of lymph, lymph nodes and all different kinds of cells. 
So you have billions, billions of normal organisms, different types of bacteria in the gut that we call normal flora that are there for a reason. And we'll address that shortly again in a minute. The appendix, well, we're still not quite sure about the appendix. We know you can live without it. We will come back to this bone marrow. So I want you to keep in mind bone marrow, OK? All right, now I want to see just a little closer up an example of what happens. So what is Gray's Anatomy? Anybody ever heard of Gray's Anatomy? It's a TV show, right? <laughs> what was it before it was a TV show? It was an anatomy, you guys are so good. It was an anatomy textbook, and it's still a classic. And this is a picture from Gray's Anatomy where, you know, close to 100 years ago, they already understood that these lymphatic vessels drained to these lymph nodes, and you can see how they kind of congregate right around the neck here, where we get exposed to a lot of things from the outside world. So even in Gray's Anatomy, they have this nice little illustration if you were to peel off all the skin, this is muscle around the eye and the various muscles of the scalp and head. And you can see a lot of lymph nodes there. So that's an example of the lymphatic system. OK, let's move along. When? When do we get an immune system? That's a really good question. When do we get an immune system? Well, we do know that the immune system starts well before we're actually born. And there are influences within the uterus, in the maternal womb, that can probably have profound effects on the entire life of that individual. So not much you can do about that, you know? I mean, your mom did what your mom did, but that's also an area of active research. Are there things that mom can eat or not eat to be exposed to, not be exposed to? Um, lots of questions that we have about what can mom do, if anything, to ensure the best and healthiest immune system of her offspring. And from the moment early in, it's not clear exactly how early, but when you're a fetus and when that immune system starts, every moment the rest of your life until the day, the moment you die, that immune system is working, OK? So I know a lot of you teenagers think that you work really hard and that your schedule is very hectic, but you're not working every second every hour, every day for your entire life. You get to sleep sometimes, right? Not your immune system. Even when you're snoring away or having a good nap, your immune system is working hard and always on guard. So I hope I've impressed you with how hard that immune system works throughout your lifetime. Yes, ma'am. The question is, when does the immune system actually kick in, and how do you tell? That's not really well defined yet, but we know it's actually pretty early. It's not as easy to tell in for the immune system as it is for something like the heart, because when you look at the first ultrasound, you can see that little tiny heart. It's harder to see immune cells at work. So we know that it's fairly early. I can't give you an exact time. Um, there are some pediatric immunologists who's, who do study that. So we're learning more about that all the time. But it is early um, within the development of the fetus, OK? All right, let's keep moving along here. We've got a ways to go. Next question is what? Who? OK, you guys are good. OK, so who has an immune system? <laughs> we, we all have an immune system, OK? Every one of us has an immune system. And for the most part, our immune systems are very, very similar. Now, there's no doubt that during our lifetime, we have a lot of environmental influences that can kind of change our immune systems and change the way that we react to the outside world. So the environment is important, but we're all born with similar types of immune systems. Now, the other thing that's important to realize is that all vertebrates have immune systems, and many of them are very much like ours. There are whole floors of laboratories here that can study the immune system in mice, for example. Now, thankfully, we're not identical to mice. <laughs> there are some differences. But there are um, animals who have many similar things about their immune system that humans have. And that's a little bit humbling. And even invertebrates, animals that don't have backbones and have been on the planet for a long, long time, they have immune systems too, although there are some fundamental differences between the immune systems of humans and the immune systems of some of the animals, and especially animals we're less closely related with, maybe um, fish and, um, say, reptiles. There are some significant differences. OK, so what is this? 
oh, somebody is really good. This is O'Hare, um, the Chicago International Airport. So why do I have a picture of this? If you think about an international airport, it is just mind boggling. You have thousands of people who arrive every day by bus, by car, by plane, by taxi cab, by limo, and all of these people arrive at the airport and then they might check their baggage. They, they go through security, right? Everybody's checked at security. And then they might go get something to eat. They go to their terminal. Then they hear their flight has been delayed and it's at another terminal. They go somewhere else. And then they take off maybe a short distance or far away. And then all the planes come in. If there's a bad storm, they change the whole schedule around. They adapt and something else happens. The complexity of an international airport is so impressive to me. But let me tell you, this airport has nothing compared to the immune system. The immune system is mind-bogglingly, is that a word, mind-bogglingly? It is now, more complex than Chicago O'Hare International Airport, okay? It is a very complex process. So what I get to do now is in the next 10 or 15 min minutes summarize um, key aspects of the immune system so that when we meet Elizabeth, we'll be able to think about important parts of the immune system that we've just learned about. Okay, so what are some of the key players in the immune system? Well, there are what we call sentinel cells in tissues. So as we talked about before, if you have a cut in your skin, there are cells of the immune system there waiting and their purpose there is to identify something in general and to wave that sign. Anybody see Lost in Space in the early 60s? I was, of course, way too young for that. But you know, <laughs> there was danger, danger, the robot always said, the, the, the earlier R2-D2. And so some of these sentinel cells say, here's a foreign substance. This is dangerous. We need to act. Okay? They're sentinel cells. They're up front. They're like the security guards but they do a lot more than, than what we might think. Circulating cells, examples might be neutrophils, monocytes, eosinophils, and lymphocytes. And we're gonna cover um, a number of these in more detail in just a minute. And then tissue cells. Well, you wouldn't think that actual structural tissues in the body would be involved in the immune system, but in fact they are. There are cells that are just staying in place and they're part of the body that are nevertheless involved in immune responses. So when I say that the immune system is almost everywhere in the body, I truly mean it with all different processes going on. And so it's very, very complex. But let's take a little closer look at some of these cells. So stem cells are the baby cells. And the stem cells from, remember that picture that had the bone marrow? Okay, that's where the stem cells come from. So the stem cells have a choice. They can become myeloid cells of the lineage, lineage myeloid cells and divide, um, mature rather, into any one of these cells following the arrows. Okay? Or they might decide to mature into the lymphoid line and the lymphoid cells become T lymphocytes so-called because those cells mature in, remember that thymus I talked about underneath the breastbone on the lymphatic si system? Picture there was a blob right under the breastbone there. The thymus is where T lymphocytes mature. And if you want to use sort of a military analogy, the T lymphocytes and the lymphocytes in general are kind of like generals in the military. They make executive decisions about what to do. The B cells generally mature in the bone marrow, but they also have much more maturity within the tissues and the lymph nodes. I showed you some of those pictures of the lymph nodes. The B cells are very active in the lymph nodes, and that's where T and B cells talk to each other. We'll talk about that a little bit more. NK cells, natural killer cells. I'm not really gonna address those very much tonight. We used to think that natural killer cells were predominantly part of what we call the innate system, um, the innate system is what acts first, and we're about to talk about that. But it turns out that in recent years, we've learned that the natural killer cells, which will kill you unless you convince them not to, okay, so they're automatic killers unless you instruct them not to, give them the right signals, they actually are very important with maybe even a little bit of memory. So the cells are quite complex, but we're going to take a little bit closer of a look at some of these. 
but we're going to look at it specifically in the context of infection, okay? Because we've talked about programmed cell death and cancer. We've talked about cleaning up wounds and all sorts of things. But to sort of give an example, we'll talk about infection specifically, okay? Different types of infection. Let's think about viruses, bacteria, fungi, worms, parasitic protozoa. They're, these are just examples of different kinds of organisms that can be an external threat to us that might want to eat us or devour us or live in us or in some other way um, wreak havoc with our bodies. And so the immune system responds in a couple of ways. Innate immunity is the, in general, kind of the early response where you've got those sentinel cells right up front that recognize that there's an invader, okay, and they respond. The adaptive or acquired immunity, the adaptive immunity is the subsequent response. And what's really neat about the adaptive immunity is that it responds very specifically to that organism, okay? So, um, what I, one of the things that I wanted to mention before looking just a little bit more closely at that is the general time frame. The innate immune system takes place in about, oh, within immediately to about four hours where that initial recognition occurs. Danger, danger, something's going on, we need to react to this, okay? Then for the next four to 96 hours or so, there are some other signaling going on, and these cells signal the lymphocytes, and they give them the general signals about what is happening, and they present evidence of this foreign invader, and then those lymphocytes make decisions about how to respond. But it can actually be days before you get the really specific response exactly for that particular organism. Okay, so you get a general response to begin with and then a more specific one later on. So let's take a brief look at some of the ways that we have of battling infectious organisms. Well, one might be a mechanical or physical barrier. What's one physical barrier we've mentioned already? Skin. The skin, very good. But there are other barriers as well. Let's say you happen to swallow a nasty bug that wants to give you a gastroenteritis. gastroenteritis. Well, I guess Norovirus is the popular one right now, right? A lot of people are getting infections and nausea, vomiting, diarrhea um, with this particular kind of bug. So if you think of what it has to survive to do its duty, it's a lot. Even if it manages to get past what's going on in the throat and the saliva it has to mix with, and then even if you swallow it and it gets in the stomach, your stomach is churning things all around. You swallow, how much mucus do you think you make and swallow a day? a liter, at least a liter, maybe more than that. Sometimes two liters, depending on what's happening. So you make a lot of, of mucus and saliva, and you know that when you eat things, you produce saliva, right? And then you swallow it. So this poor bug has to compete with all that mucus and saliva. It's being churned around. I mean, it, it must be kind of an uncomfortable ride going down there. So there are chemical barriers as well, which would be acid. The, the stomach has a lot of major acid in it, and a lot of bugs can't even survive that. Okay, so that's another challenge that a bug has to overcome. Um, microbiological competition, I mentioned that you guys really are just, to quote one of my colleagues, Homer Boucher, you are really just muni buses for bacteria and various organisms because we are loaded in the gut, especially with billions and billions of bacteria. And any infectious type of organism has to compete with all that. So you can imagine how difficult it would be You get down there and all of a sudden you and, and a billion of your closest friends have to, um, you have to compete with all of them to be able to try and actually infect your host. The complement system, very briefly, is a part of the immune system that kind of tags the foreigner, okay? So I would put it like a red tag on that particular bug and that gives a signal to other parts of the immune system to kill it, deal with it. Okay? And then there's another part of the immune system we're still learning so much about, toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptors also are part of the innate immune system at the front line, and they just recognize patterns. So you know in World War II, if you were an American and you had an American uniform on, if you saw someone else wearing an American uniform, you would assume what? You, weren't, you wouldn't want to shoot that person, right? You would want to say, you're okay. I'm gonna move on. That's an example of tolerance. I recognize you, you're okay, I'm gonna move on. But 
If you were an American soldier and you came face to face with someone wearing a Nazi uniform, your alarms would go up and you would say, I'm, I'm at risk here, I might die. I've gotta take care of this, I've gotta handle this. So I wouldn't know, or that soldier wouldn't know the other soldier's name. He wouldn't know where he was from. He wouldn't know his answer. So he wouldn't know the details about him, but he, was, he would know that he was wearing the wrong kind of uniform and I need to get help here. And that's an example, it's really simplified, of what toll-like receptors do. So you can see there are all these different ways, and this is just some of them, that the innate immune system up front deals with unwanted bacteria and other types of organisms. One more thing, phagocytes. Phagocytosis, your next vocabulary word. Phagocytosis comes from the roots to devour, sell, and process of, okay? So if I'm a phagocyte and I showed you some of those cells on that cell line before on the right-hand side like neutrophils and macrophages, they're examples of phagocytes. And if I'm a phagocyte, I come in contact with you and I don't like your looks, what do I do? I eat you, <laughs> okay? It's as simple as that. And I eat you, and then I process you, I chop you up into little bits, I process you, put you down the assembly line, and then my plan is going to be to present a little piece of you along with a self-recognition to maybe a lymphocyte, to say, this is me, don't kill me, and this is a piece of this little organism that I ate, what do you want me to do about it? Okay, so that's how some of that communication occurs. So phagocytosis is for ingesting things that the immune system doesn't want to have. And I've got some cool pictures here for you. Okay, this one is actually from a mouse. And you can see that this macrophage, one of those cells that we were showing, is actually putting out these, they're almost like hands. It's sensing its environment. If it finds something it doesn't like, it's going to bring it in and it's going to ingest it. Okay, so it's just to show you, it's not just a little round blob like you might see in a textbook. These are very active um, cells. And here's another one that's really good. This one is, remember we talked about anthrax at the beginning? This is a neutrophil here in yellow that is starting to consume anthrax. Okay, you see that? So this is one of the ways that we can address anthrax, but nevertheless, even though we've got a good immune system, anthrax can kill a lot of people. So these cells are very active, and that term is phagocytosis. Okay, and I have something special for you tonight, and we'll see if this video will come on, which it should. And this is an example from um, David Rogers, who actually filmed this quite a long time ago now. He's from Vanderbilt. It's on YouTube. It's much better than any video game. You can go in and watch neutrophils consuming bacteria, okay? And here's an example of that. So there's the neutrophil. It looks like this little cluster of bacteria is running for its life. It's running, or it's actually not running, but it kind of looks like that. So the neutrophil is sensing it because the bacteria is sending out almost a scent that it detects, and then it engulfs it. Okay, yay, victory. Okay. So that's an example of phagocytosis in action. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, and beyond all of that, you have something else that is very important in the process of these initial stages of immunity, and that is these cilia. Cilia are hair-like projections, in this case from an electron micrograph, of um, the, the trachea, which is the large part of the windpipe. And these hair-like projections move constantly, like this. And so if you inhale particles, or you have particles that you don't want there, these cilia continuously point the way to the exit for all of these particles, okay? So this way, you wanna come out this way. So these cilia are very important to help move things to the exit door rather than letting them get deeper into the body. I hope none of you smoke, and the reason why is because what? Correct, if you smoke, you destroy your cilia. So you know, after you hear for years, People who smoke, they start to start, they hack and they start getting all this phlegm and you can kind of hear them coughing up. Part of that is because they can't manage that mucus and phlegm anymore because they've destroyed the cilia, 
okay? So for several reasons, the cilia are important. And it turns out we're learning that the cilia are not just mechanical. They actually have immune properties too. So even the cilia have specific immune properties that help in the battle against infection. But the question is, does damage continue even though you stop? And in general, if you stop smoking, the destruction slows down and stops. Okay? And that's true for a lot of the problems that you have with the lungs with smoking. Um, if you stop smoking, um, you do have an, in, well, you have an increased risk of lung cancer if you smoke, but when you stop, as time passes, that risk of developing lung cancer decreases over time. Do you grow new cilia? I don't think so. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think so. So next, we talked about all of that was innate immunity, things that happen right up front. Let's talk very briefly about acquired immunity. And with acquired immunity, this really is the subsequent responses, which are more specific. So it's not just recognizing a uniform, but knowing exactly who your enemy is. Okay? Let's go back to those cells that we looked at before. And what you saw a few minutes ago was a neutrophil in that video that consumed Staph aureus, was that particular organism. Macrophages also can um, consume them. And actually, the myeloid line is also what produces erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. Not talking about those tonight. Now let's talk about the innate immune system. And that really focuses on lymphocytes, and specifically tonight, very brief words about T and B lymphocytes. So we've got a couple more vocabulary words. And those are antigen and antibody, OK? So when I'm talking about a specific immune response, this is a really specific response. So an antigen is a substance either within or outside the body that triggers an immune response and in particular causes the production of antibodies. Okay? So this is going to seem a little circular. What is an antibody? An antibody is a protein. It's also called an immunoglobulin. So if you've heard the term immunoglobulin, that's another word for antibody. Um, this is produced by B lymphocytes in response to very specific triggers, foreign substances, or sometimes you might be familiar with the term autoimmune disease. Sometimes we actually make antibodies against ourselves. That's when you have failure of tolerance. Remember we talked about tolerance? You should be able to recognize yourself and not attack yourself, but for reasons that we don't yet fully understand. Sometimes our immune system attacks ourself, and we can have problems with autoimmune disease. Thyroid problems, multiple sclerosis, lupus, those are all examples of autoimmune disease. So let's um, talk about antibodies, which are able to identify and we'll say neutralize their target. OK? So antibodies are very important. And one of the important things about antibodies is that by the time you're in middle life, how many antibodies, specific antibodies, do you think you might have? There's, there have been estimates about this. So think about how many things your immune system has responded to. Remember when I said it works every second of your life, that your immune system has responded to and said, I need to make an antibody against this to protect the body. We're estimating probably 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 10th billions and billions of specific responses and antibodies, and we can respond to them that precisely. So in this slide, an antigen, which let's say um, influenza, OK? You're exposed to influenza, or maybe uh, there, there might be a better example if we're talking about an, uh, an organism that gets consumed into an antigen-presenting cell, which is like the neutrophil or the macrophage. So probably better to take a different organism. But for that example, the organism is consumed, processed, and then presented to one of those T lymphocytes. And that T lymphocyte, one of the generals of the immune system, then makes decisions about how to respond to it depending on what kind of organism it is. So that lymphocyte can make a decision. Do I need to respond this way? Do I need to respond this way or what? And that depends on whether it's a virus, bacteria, or whatever different kind of organism it might be, that decision is made. In the end analysis, and what we're going to be looking at tonight with Elizabeth, 
is the production, the communication to B cells to please produce antibodies specifically against this organism. And so the B cell then matures, and the B cell then ends up producing antibodies specific for that exact bug. Okay? It's a pretty cool system. So what does an antibody look like? Well, obviously it doesn't look exactly like this, but the point here is that this business end of this whole antibody is completely specific for only one organism. So if it's influenza, there is the influenza antigen, and here's an antibody that on the business end of this organism will only react to influenza. It's that specific, okay? It's just amazing. And I have a picture here for you, a close-up picture of a lymphocyte. And again, you can tell that this guy means business, okay? This is not some flat beach ball sitting on the side with a you know, nice cocktail enjoying the day. These lymphocytes are busy and active all the time. So this is what a lymphocyte looks like close up. And all of this part of the lymphocyte is very immunologically active. This lymphocyte would attach to a different cell and when those cells talk to each other, the immune response occurs. Let me show you that right here again. So what happens is, let's say you've got a T cell here, the T lymphocyte, and it might have, this is obviously very bald here, it might have a lot of these things on the surface of it, but it has to go right up to that B cell, and we actually can get videos of it, I, I don't have one for you tonight, but they actually come right up to each other and they talk to each other and then they kind of communicate and connect, and they have things that actually connect to each other to send signals. Yes? Yes, so here's the lymphocyte, the one that says T, thank you for asking, is a T lymphocyte, and the one that says B is a B lymphocyte. T is a lymphocyte type of helper cell, which is sending signals for another immune reaction. And here, this lymphocyte is developing killer T cells, another type of lymphocyte that works yet differently. So thank you for asking that and letting me clarify that. So this, these are lymphocytes that mature and have very specific reactions depending on the organism. That's how they make the decision. Um, this was uh, the blood cells, and here you can see a lymphocyte in the blood. Here's a red blood cell, and you can see how it's kind of shaped like a donut. That, it's very flexible, and that allows it to go into really narrow capillaries, even into the skin, so it's very flexible and bendable. And there are other cells in the blood also, some platelets that are kind of sticky, and they allow for uh, proper clotting. But this is just an example of how busy it can be in the blood with all different kinds of cells and activity. Okay, so we're just about done. Um, so in summary, the lymphocytes, after they identify more specifically what the invader is, the lymphocytes then generate a specific immunologic response that specifically and maximally targets the pathogen. Okay, so lymphocytes are very important to orchestrate a very specific immune response, so they're really important. So did anybody get an influenza vaccine this year? Yeah, so probably most of you had a flu vaccine this year. And so guess what's happening when you get a flu vaccine? With the flu vaccine, where do you get it? Usually in the arm, right under the skin. So what happens when the immune system sees that vaccine that gets injected? There are sentinel cells, right? We've talked about sentinel cells that say, ooh, danger, this looks like influenza, even though it's not. It fakes the immune system out. And those danger signals send a message, eventually gets to the lymphocytes, usually in the lymph nodes, but can be other places. The lymphocytes then send the signal to produce ultimately those antibodies through the B lymphocytes. And so the next time you are actually exposed to influenza, what happens? Your immune system doesn't have to wait four or five or six days to make that response from the beginning. Your immune system is primed. You've already prepared antibodies that are specific for that kind of influenza. So you're ready to go, okay? So that's an example of how the immune system can respond with a vaccine. All right. So it's time to meet our patient. Why do we need to take vaccines every year? That's a great question. For the influenza, and the reason for that is that every year, um, 
scientists around the world look to see which strains of influenza are circulating. Because some years, there are many different kinds of influenza. And some years, some are circulating and some are not. And so they make an educated guess based upon what they see in other parts of the world as to which types of influenza they think will be showing up in the United States each year. Sometimes they're really right, and sometimes there are new strains of influenza that come along. So if we're lucky, and this year we were pretty lucky, the um, vaccine was pretty much on target for the type of flu that came around this year. But that's a great question because it reflects the fact that there are many different kinds of influenza. But how many times in your life do you get a measles vaccine? Not very often. And your immune system has long-term memory. After you get that vaccine, it can remember it a long time. But influenza, there are different strains that look a little different every year. OK? Let's move on and have Elizabeth come on up. I'm going to have Elizabeth stand right here. And I'm going to um, take a place right behind the podium. And um, Elizabeth um, is a patient of mine in clinic, and she's just a beautiful, delightful young woman who um, is such a pleasure to work with her. And she has a condition called Common Variable Immunodeficiency, which is a horrible name. Um, but it is a deficiency of immunity that has some specific manifestations. And I thought it might be um, helpful to the audience and helpful to me to learn more about Elizabeth by asking her a few questions. And so um, Elizabeth was, you were diagnosed with this immune deficiency at what age? I was seven. You were age seven. Mm -hmm. OK. And what was, what did you first notice? What do you remember about that time? Um, well, and this is kind of from what my mother told me as well, because I was born healthy. Uh, no problems. I had normal vaccinations. About the time that I was three years old, I started to get really sick. Um, I would actually go from specialist to specialist. Uh, one doctor suggested we take out part of my lung. I had my tonsils removed. I had my adenoids removed. I had tubes in my ears. I had ear infection after ear infection, cough, like just horrible coughs. Um, it wasn't until I was about seven years old that I went to Children's Hospital in Dallas, Texas, where uh, I was finally diagnosed with common variable immunodeficiency. Okay. And so were you, were you missing a lot of school at that time? Um, I don't really remember. I don't think I did, but if I, I may have. I just always remember being, I, I was home, I remember the summer before I was diagnosed, I got really, really sick, and I had to stay home from camp. So I was really oh. upset about that. <laughs> 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 but um, no, I, I mean, I, I functioned like a regular kid. I just was sick, but it was a sickness that was unexplained. OK. And so what kind of infections? Um, you mentioned that you had ear tubes, so you were having problems with ear infections? I had a lot of ear infections, very painful ear infections. I do remember that. I, I, I would be crying. Um, my mom, she just, she's like, oh my gosh, I can't, I cannot help you. I don't know what's wrong. Uh, lots of ear infections, um, lots of throat problems. I was just always sick, was really. I, um, I mean, this is kind of going into family stuff, but uh, I, my dad had leukemia, and at the same time, I was actually seeing the same doctor as he was seeing, because they still didn't know what was wrong with me. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That was a problem. And so, um, so you had. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So I'm going to repeat. Yeah, and and just to let you know, I'm repeating your questions because this is on videotape and they can't hear you, but. Um, the question is related la to, to lab tests. Are there lab tests that can be done to detect this? And the answer is yes. But one of the challenges is that most doctors have not had training in this area. There aren't that many people who specialize in clinical immunology or problems with the immune system. And so most doctors don't either don't recognize it or they don't know what to do about it. Um, and so. But when you do suspect the diagnosis, there are some specific tests that you can order. And one of them is, gets right to the heart of what this gentleman in front was asking about, and that was the antibodies. 
we can measure the level of the antibodies, or lack thereof, in Elizabeth's immune system. And I think that's probably what they did at that time, because we were able to measure antibody levels. And with this particular condition, um, people with CVID may make antibodies, but they may be really low. And some people make almost no antibodies, whether it's IgA, IgG, IgM, or any of the different kinds of antibodies. So yes, that would be the first place to start, would be to measure the total antibody levels. And then there's some other tests that can be done as well, looking at a functional response. So remember how we talked about the vaccine, say an influenza vaccine, and you can be vaccinated and you get an immune response that helps you for the winter? We can actually use vaccinations like influenza vaccine or say the pneumonia vaccine, which some of you probably had, called Pneumovax. If you've not had that before, we can measure your antibodies specific to pneuma, pneumococcus, pneumococcal pneumonia. And then if they're too low, inappropriately low, we can give you the vaccine. And then three to four weeks later, we can measure it again. And we expect a certain response. We expect, we expect performance out of the immune system. And we can measure that. And so probably what happened with Elizabeth at that time was that she finally ran into somebody who said, whoa, she's having way too many infections. This is different than other kids. What's wrong here? Let's check her antibody levels. And what happened? So um, a normal is between 800 and 1,200. For the IgG? For the IgG, mine was 40. So they knew right off the bat that I was really sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave me the treatment, which is IVIG. And I have had that ever since 1990. And for now, I'm supposed to get it once a month for the rest of my life. So what is intravenous immunoglobulin, IVIG? Remember how I told you that another name for an antibody is immunoglobulin? So we can actually, if Elizabeth doesn't make IgG antibodies, and she said her level was 40, which means pretty much that her immune system is not making antibodies. In our lab system, a normal range for level of antibodies in the specific quantity that we look at would be somewhere between about 650 and 1,500, somewhere in that ballpark. And when she was first measured, she had essentially unmeasurable antibodies. Now, there's another antibody that Elizabeth doesn't make either. As I recall, you don't make much in the way of IgA antibodies. And remember I told you that those IgA antibodies are in the gut. And they're very important for processing immune function in the gut. OK? So now she's not making IgG. IgG is very important for respiratory infections. IgA, which is in the gut, you can start to imagine some of the problems that people have when they don't have these antibodies. So Elizabeth received the treatment of IgG infusions. We can give people infusions of IgG antibodies, and that's called intravenous immunoglobulin. It is possible to get it um, as an injection under the skin. If you get it by the vein, you get it usually once a month, sometimes every three weeks, depending on how fast your body breaks down antibodies normally. Um, but sometimes, for reasons that I won't go into tonight, you can actually get it under the skin. But if you do it that way, you have to get it once a week. So there are different ways that you can receive these infusions of antibodies. And that's what Elizabeth has been doing for that time. So once you started on the intravenous immunoglobulin, did things change? And if so, how? Tre well, tremendously. Um, well, something that I forgot to mention was that um, my doctors would prescribe uh, medicines, um, everything from Augmentin, uh, just any antibiotic under the sun. And for a five-year-old to take a horse pill is very daunting. And the doctors would yell at my mother and tell her, your daughter is not taking her medicine. This is awful. If you don't give it to her, she's going to get sicker. My mother gave me the medicine. I took it. I just, they didn't realize what was wrong. Um, since I've received IVIG, um, I, if I take any sort of antibiotic, anything of that nature, I can feel 10 times, 50 times better than what I initially went through as a child. So it definitely does help out a lot. And it's made my lifestyle a lot easier to, 
to take in. So. But she still has to deal with receiving these infusions once a month. And of course, you know, she kind of has to plan her life around that. But Elizabeth is not to be deterred. Elizabeth is applying for nursing school. She's an A student. And she finds out next month. Yeah, mid-March. And the schools you've applied to are? Uh, University of San Diego, um, Loyola, and uh, Union University in Tennessee. So. Just up scare. All right, so I can hardly wait to find out where Elizabeth's going to nursing school. Tell us what it's like to get the infusion. What happens when you go to get an infusion? Um, so it's, I usually have to set aside two hours of a day. Um, what's recently happened is that I have a nurse come to my house, so that makes it a lot easier for me because I don't have to plan my day around going to the hospital. Um, I get, he sticks me in, I sit there, I get my medicine. I have had some bad reactions to IVIG, but those are few and far between, and because I get it all the time, I don't really get that sick. Um, I get a little run down, but obviously your immune system's just kind of kick-starting, so you're not, you're not always gonna feel that great after your treatment, but always after the next day, I'm, I'm back to normal doing working. I, I don't miss work for being sick, I don't miss work for um, going to get my treatment. Uh, I just consider it just part of what I have to deal with. So it's just one of those things that I go and do. So the term common variable immunodeficiency really is a term that was given to this condition a long time ago because we didn't really know what caused it. And we'll talk about some of the genetic um, underlying causes later on, but um, it can manifest itself in, in a variety of different ways. But for Elizabeth, it's been predominantly these respiratory infections. So she had to deal with infection of the sinuses, infection uh, with pneumonia, and different types of infection of the ear, res really respiratory infections. And so tell us, um, has anybody else in your family had this condition or been diagnosed with it? No one. Um, they do think that my problem is genetic, and the closest that they found is just my father, who uh, was, had been diagnosed with leukemia, but still, no one in my family has what I have. Um, so that was also something to kind of deal with because we didn't have to. We didn't have somebody to work off of. So um, at this point, so far, it's just me. Yes. A question. Okay, great question. The question is, for each type of antibody, do you give a different infusion? And the answer is no. Um, what happens is, you know how people donate blood at the blood bank? And some people donate uh, in a different kind of process, where the blood bank can actually selectively take antibodies out of those blood donations. They take the antibodies out, and Elizabeth, when she gets an infusion, actually gets an infusion of donated antibodies from a lot of different people, okay? So Elizabeth is getting the benefit of many different people's immune systems, and that's really nice. If you could take the immune systems of a whole bunch of people and be protected by that, her antibody repertoire, if you will, is much broader than mine because she's getting antibodies from a lot of other people infused into her. So this is a blood product, um, but thanks to the donors who are willing to do it, she's able to receive these different types of antibodies, but it reflects the entire repertoire of very specific antibodies, whatever that individual has circulating around. So they get a lot of antibodies of all different kinds. Yes, so the question is about um, autoimmune disease. And autoimmune disease can occur in patients with common variable immunodeficiency, but not as a consequence of receiving other people's antibodies. It can be one of the manifestations of this particular disease. And so we'll talk about that in just a minute when we go back and look at the exact part of the immune system that's involved with, with her disorder. But no, receiving the antibodies, which is a very interesting and good thought, receiving the antibodies of others um, is not associated with her having a higher chance of developing autoimmune disease. We're actually looking at whether or not maybe she would be less likely to get it. So we're following a lot of patients over time to see if, 
it might be associated with a decreased incidence. But of course, that's hard to do because I don't have a placebo patient. I'm not going to tell some patient with CVID, sorry, I need to compare you to Elizabeth, so I'm not giving you immunoglobulin. We can't do that. Um, but these are all great questions. So there's a question in the back. I apologize. The light's a little bright. Yes, sir. Well, my sister wasn't either. My sister was not either, and uh, she doesn't have what I have. So. And that's a great question. Um, you do get um, a whole host of antibodies from the mom when you're in the womb. So the first month of your first six to eight months of our lives, our immune systems are not mature enough to actually produce the antibodies. So we receive antibodies from our mothers through the placenta. And those antibodies will protect us for the first six to eight months or so of our lives, those IgG antibodies from mom. But those finally wear off as our own immune systems kick in. In general, the breastfeeding is probably not going to be associated with the development of this kind of immune deficiency. But you are correct that it probably is associated with some types of problems with the immune system and maybe even with certain types of hypersensitivity of the immune system, maybe some types of allergies. So that's another area of research. Yes, ma'am. So if a healthy person to, were to receive an infusion of immunoglobulin, would they have a problem with it? Probably not. Um, the reactions that some patients get when they receive the immunoglobulin, you can imagine these immunoglobulins are antibodies, are proteins, and we're giving her a huge infusion of protein. And so some patients, when they receive the immunoglobulin, they can feel kind of flu-like for 24, 48 hours. Some people will get a headache. They're Severe reactions are quite rare, and when people do have more severe reactions, then usually we switch to giving it under the skin because that's associated with fewer reactions. It's not too often that we have to do that, but if you are a healthy person and you get an infusion of immunoglobulin, you'd probably go about your day. So no, it wouldn't have um, specific, it wouldn't create specific problems for the immune system if, if say, I, with a healthy immune system, were to receive it. Yeah, so really addressing the types of reactions that we can get. One thing that is relevant is these antibodies um, don't last forever, OK? So the body breaks down IgG antibodies in about anywhere from about 23 to 30 days. So that's why we have to keep giving infusions every 30 days. Now, you continue to have immune cells that make antibodies. Okay, so you'll continue to have production of antibodies in a healthy immune system. But since Elizabeth is not making antibodies, and her body will normally break down antibodies every 23 to 30 days, that's why we have to give her infusions about once a month. Yes, ma'am, back there. They try very hard, the, the pharmaceutical companies who make the antibodies, to have it as pure as possible to be antibodies. So the question being, are you getting all the other immune cells too? And the answer is no. Because then you might have a significant reaction. But if you're just getting the antibodies, um, then no. And it's just the antibodies. And I cannot tell you how intricate of a process it is. It's a very expensive treatment because, OK, this isn't exactly what they do, but it gives you an idea. To to separate it from the blood and to purify it, okay, because it's a blood product, they bake it, they boil it, they fry it, they filter it, they bake it again, they boil it again, they fry it again, they filter out all the other kinds of antibodies, all the other types of cells, and after a long, arduous process, they come up with IgG antibodies that are about as pure as you can get. Some of the products have a little bit of IgA in there, but really the business antibodies that we need are the IgG antibodies. And so the intravenous immunoglobulin is pretty much pure IgG antibodies with a few things mixed in just to make sure the antibodies don't clump up together. So when you receive it, you want the antibodies to be all nicely separated out. Um, so that it's a pure product and you don't have an immune reaction to it. Um, yes, over here. Yes, I can, I can tell a difference between the beginning of the month and the end of the month. I can tell when I'm, even when I go see Dr. Gunling, I'm like, I'm feeling run down. And then she's like, when's your next treatment? I'm like, oh, it's in three days. Um, also, time of the year makes a huge difference. So when other people around me are getting sick, I get sick. Um, so cold and flu season do affect me. I will say I've never had the flu, knock on wood, but I do get sick. Um, I just cough a lot, 
uh, people are always like, oh, you have a smoker's cough. And I'm like, no, actually, let me tell you what I have. So, uh, <laughs> and then, do you have a couple of hours? <laughs> do you want to hear my life story? <laughs> so, um, but mostly I, I can definitely tell, a, like feel a difference. And especially if I'm getting prescribed, I, I, I try not to take antibiotics if I don't have to, mm -hmm. just because I don't want to develop any sort of immunity from that. But for the most part, if I'm absolutely, truly sick, I, or I, I will feel sluggish towards the end of the month. And so we talked before about how many of you have had the influenza vaccine, and your immune systems responded to it and made specific antibodies. Just imagine how many different influenza antibodies she has receiving the benefit of the antibodies from so many different people. So she's got a lot of protection from influenza on the basis of the antibodies that she's getting from other people. So a lot of times people will ask, do people with this condition need to get vaccines? Um, sometimes the answer is yes, because some people with this condition do still have some immune function. So in general, for Elizabeth's particular situation, I would say any vaccine that's not live, okay? So any vaccine that's a particle or what I call dead vaccines, because it's easier for patients to think about it. So influenza is not a live vaccine. Some of the viral vaccines, like measles, mumps, rubella, are live vaccines, and she may not have an immune system to really manage that. So you can get the illness from a live vaccine if your immune system doesn't have the ability to respond to it. But many of the patients with CVID actually do have antibody responses to certain things and not other things. And her specific susceptibility we'll see in just a minute. Let's take one more question. And yes, OK, right here. Um, so the question is regarding, do we have artificial antibodies yet? And the answer is not yet. Um, you can imagine how complex it would be to mimic an immune system that makes very specific responses to billions of different specific antigens. On the other hand, we do have some engineered antibodies that we're starting to use for some illnesses. Um, so if anybody here has really bad asthma and you were hospitalized and on a lot of medication for that, it wasn't well controlled, there's now an engineered antibody that um, specifically addresses an antigen, actually another antibody, within the body to reduce that ability of the body to have allergic reactions. So yes, there is some engineering going on, but there's no way right now that we can replicate hundreds of thousands of millions of specific antibodies that she's getting donated from humans. So there's right now there's no substitute for the human product because the human immune system is so complex and so amazing. All right, so um, Elizabeth, um, anything else that was in your family? Your dad had leukemia and any other illnesses that run in the family? Just cancer. Okay. Um, my all my grandparents basically died from cancer, so. Okay, what kinds of cancer did they have? My grandmother had colon cancer. I don't remember what my grandfather had. Um, my grandmother on my dad's side had cervical cancer. And I don't remember what my other grandfather had. So um, mostly just uh, cancer runs in my family. Okay. And that's about it for. All right, so um, for sake of time, um, Elizabeth, why don't you come on over here? And um, we're going to talk a little bit briefly about um, what's happening with Elizabeth's immune system so we can stick within our time frame. And then after we're done, um, when all of the rest of this is off, um, we can ask Elizabeth more questions if need be. But we want to see what we learned today and how it applies to you. And so let's take a look. Common variable immunodeficiency. OK, depends on whose study you look at, but it's probably 1 in 30,000 to 1 in 70,000 people. So any mid-sized town likely has somebody with it. We're getting better at recognizing it, so there might be more people than we had originally thought. You can be diagnosed with this condition at any time of your life. So if you're someone who has a very obvious problem with the immune system and you're making no antibodies, like Elizabeth, you could be diagnosed at a very young age, maybe as young as a year and a half or two years or maybe even a little younger when your mother's antibodies that she donated to you wear off. 
Okay, if you have no more IgG antibodies, you start to get infected, right? So you can be diagnosed at a very young age if you're not producing antibody. The oldest person I have diagnosed is 92. She had been the sickest person of her family and friends her whole life. She had had all kinds of infections, but she had still been able to live her life. And finally, a doctor said to her, why are you having all these infections? And she came to see us, and sure enough, she met criteria for having common variable immunodeficiency. So I was a little hesitant to put a 92-year-old on intravenous immunoglobulin, and in fact, we actually gave her the subcutaneous route, which was probably a little bit safer for her. And you know what the hardest thing was about it for her to get that immunoglobulin? She had a very busy social schedule. <laughs> and she was not tolerating the time it took which with the subcutaneous is maybe, you know, all told an hour or so, depending on how much you have to get. But, you know, she was very busy on Saturdays, and it was kind of interfering with that social schedule. Just a delightful lady. And you know what? She is so much healthier and enjoying life, and she's on her weekly immunoglobulin. And because it's subcutaneous and it's administered by a nurse, she has a weekly visit from a nurse that she's gotten to know real well and kind of checks in on her, and it's been a great relationship. So. It really kind of depends on when someone thinks about that diagnosis. You know, if you've had a lot of sinus infections over and over, and pneumonias over and over, you wind up in the intensive care unit with a huge infection, you have to ask why, right? What's different about this person than the other person? And it might be that they have an immune deficiency. So let's take a look specifically at infections, because that's been the main problem with Elizabeth. So bad colds or bronchitis. Now I want to say that when people come in and they say, I have colds and bronchitis, colds and bronchitis, that actually might not be an immune deficiency. It might be something like hay fever and asthma that's untreated. It might be allergic rhinitis, a lot of allergies and asthma. And we see this over and over. And that's much more common than a primary deficiency of the immune system. Does that make sense? So we think of all the other things it could be, too, which are more common. But I want to show you a picture of what sinusitis looks like and then what pneumonia looks like. Here's a CT scan. And you can see the dark area lower down here is a maxillary sinus, which is one of the sinuses behind the cheekbone. And where it's black, that is air. So what's going on with this maxillary sinus? It's not black. It's gray, which means it's full of gunk, OK? So this person has a left, it's kind of like stage left and stage right, a left-sided maxillary sinusitis. Now, I'm sorry to tell you, you've got a lot of holes in your head. Sinuses are basically holes in the head. We're not quite sure why they're there. But we do know that if it were solid bone, if all this were bone, this were bone, all the different sinuses were bone, your head would be very heavy. And it would be really hard to hold your head up properly. You'd be going around like this because your head would weigh so much. That might be one reason. We don't know. But people can get infections in the sinuses over and over. That's a sinus that's completely full. Let's take a look, quick picture at a chest x-ray. So this chest x-ray, again, stage left and stage right. Um, and this person, you can see air, which is normal for the lung. This, there are multiple things that are abnormal about this x-ray, but you can see on this side, there's air, which is the black. You can't quite see the diaphragm very clearly there, but what you really see is this thing. That's the positive circle sign, OK? So this person probably has a pneumonia in that particular lobe of the lung. People who have common variable immunodeficiency can get pneumonias over and over. One of the things that Elizabeth has had has been a pneumonia when she was younger that probably chewed up a little bit of the lung so that she has a little bit of an ongoing problem with lung tissue that's no longer normal and is more subject to infections because that lung tissue isn't normal anymore because it got so badly chewed up when she was a kid with infection and not, not treated quite yet. And here's what a CT scan might look like with an abnormal chest. Here's the backbone, so you can tell that this person is face up. Again, this is the right side. And this is the right lung, where you can see that in the left lung, there's all of this air. And on the right side, there's this big thing here. 
okay? And so there are many ways that we can pick up on radiologic imaging problems that occur in people with common variable immunodeficiency. And sometimes we do end up doing CT scans to see if they have any long-term damage to their lungs, as one example. So why respiratory infections? And here we're about to um, finish our last five minutes or so. Well, why respiratory infections? Why not bladder infections? Why not other types of infections, which sometimes people with primary immune deficiencies can get? But Elizabeth, as you heard from her story, really had a lot of these respiratory infections with ears and sinus and lungs. Well, there's at least one important part of the immune system that's not working properly. And we talked about that. It's the antibodies, OK? So there are some specific bugs or organisms that we really rely on antibodies for treating. OK, you can have a lot of innate immune processes, and the innate immune system might address some of it. But if you don't have antibodies, you're much more likely to have that particular kind of infection. So this leads to susceptibility to infection with predictable bugs. We know which bugs, based on this immune dysfunction, what types of bugs she's most susceptible to. And two of them, not, this is not the whole list, but two of them are bugs called Streptococcus pneumoniae. Remember I mentioned the pneumonia vaccine? The pneumonia vaccine vaccinates you against this bug. So we often call it pneumococcus for short. Another one is called Haemophilus influenza. But this is not influenza like influenza virus. This is actually a, a kind of bacteria. And in the last few years, Elizabeth has become very well acquainted with Haemophilus. We've had to deal with a few Haemophilus influenza infections. And I've got a picture here for you of what close up streptococcal pneumoniae, streptococcus pneumoniae looks like. So these days, we can take some of these close up pictures. We know what these organisms look like. It's pretty cool that we can get to know them in ways that we never thought we might want to. Um, but going back to this particular diagram, if Elizabeth is exposed to pneumococcus, we rely on her lymphocytes, remember those lymphocytes, the T lymphocytes, communicating, saying, hey, we're exposed to pneumococcus, OK? We want her T lymphocyte to communicate with the B lymphocyte and say, pneumococcus, I need for you to produce antibodies specific against pneumococcus, OK? So the B cell then gets to work. The B cell matures. The B cell does all sorts of things and then starts to kick out antibodies, lots and lots and lots of antibodies specific to pneumococcus, OK? That's what we want her immune system to do and what we expect it to do. So with Elizabeth's type of common variable immunodeficiency, this is where her problem is, OK? Something in here isn't working right because she's not producing antibodies. We know from the fact that she doesn't have a lot of infections that are related to T lymphocyte malfunction, that she probably doesn't have problems with her T lymphocytes. We think they're probably working OK, because she would have a lot of infe other infections. You might think of people who have HIV. Their T lymphocytes get invaded by HIV, and they get a lot of infections when their T lymphocytes are not working properly. So Elizabeth is probably somewhere in the B cell that is either not receiving the signal properly, or it's not getting the proper machinery in order or not, for some reason, producing these antibodies. There are some people with this condition who only produce, say, IgA and IgM, but they don't produce any IgG. We see all different variations of it, hence the name common variable immunodeficiency. So is there a genetic predisposition? Well, it's interesting that her dad had leukemia because we do see leukemia types of disorders a little more commonly in family members of patients who have primary immune deficiencies. And we also see lymphoma a little more commonly. Um, in some patients, hopefully 10 years from now, we'll be able to predict, because there's so many different kinds of CVID, we might be able to predict, 
you are more susceptible to developing uh, lymphoma later in life because some of these patients do develop autoimmune disease or lymphoma. So it's not just that they have problems with antibodies, although some are really pure, pretty antibody problems. But other people, especially those who have the T lymphocyte disorders, can develop other problems as well, autoimmune diseases, certain types of cancers that they're more susceptible to. But Elizabeth has really been up until now, quite a pure antibody disorder type of problem. She receives immunoglobulin. She doesn't get quite as many of the infections. OK, so other diseases of the immune system, other types of primary immune deficiency might have much simpler types of genetic defects that are more easily defined. And in upcoming lectures in this seminar series, you will hear more about um, genetics and about genes and how genes can be involved in um, the regulation of health and disease. So there are many different kinds of um, common variable immunodeficiency. And so far, about 10 to 15% of the patients, we know specific genetic defects that are identified. And usually, these are people who have it running in the family, multiple family members. In Elizabeth's case, she's the only person in the family who specifically has CVID. And hers might be a little bit different. So she will be studied at some time. Not quite yet. Um, and then, so stay tuned for upcoming talks about genetics. OK, so our summary, immunity, a condition in humans that per permits innate, hardwired, and adaptive, acquired resistance to disease. OK, we've talked about those, the innate and the acquired. Promotes and maintains health through proper recognition and management of external, which might be external invaders or influences, might be infection, pollution. I heard that cough. Uh, or internal ones, which might be wound repair. That's a normal process of the immune system. Or remember, programmed cell death. The immune system does a pretty good job of catching a lot of cancers early and taking them out of commission. OK, we need to review our vocabulary, right? So very briefly, what's tolerance? Tolerance, of course, as we talked about, is the ability of the immune system to decide what's a threat and what's not. Tolerance enables us not to attack our own bodies, OK? Tolerance enables me to hold a nice little furry kitty and not sneeze and have horrible asthma. So tolerance is a major part of what the immune system does. And it's a, we wish that everybody had perfect tolerance, OK? But there are a lot of people who don't, and that's an area of a lot of research. Why? Um, apoptosis, programmed cell death. That's the neat and tidy death of things that are ready to die inside the body, OK? Programmed cell death. Lymphatic system. Yeah, so the lymphatic system is parts of the body where really there's a lot of activity of the immune system where it focuses. We talked about lymph nodes. We talked about um, Peyer's patches in the gut where there are um, a lot of the antigens that the gut sees are processed. Um, the thymus behind the breastbone where T lymphocytes develop. So specific parts of the body, spleen, where a lot of immune activity is centralized. Phagocytosis, you saw the video of phagocytosis, right? That Staph aureus didn't have a chance. That immune cell just gobbled him up, OK? Um, antibody and antigen. I think we've gone over those in enough detail. And so the question is, have we achieved our learning goals? I think we've described the essential purposes of the immune system in 90 minutes or less about. Um, understand how living with a primary disorder of immunity can affect daily life. And Elizabeth, who has had this condition for most of her life, thank you very much, is going on with life, dealing with it, which most patients do. Um, some people do have other types of infections or problems. But Elizabeth receives her immunoglobulin every month. She does get infections. We do have to deal with infections as they come along. At some point, we might need to adjust how much immunoglobulin she's getting or how frequently she gets it. We often have to do surveillance for other conditions. We make sure that the skin looks OK, that there's no evidence of cancer of the skin. Sometimes we check for infections in the gut, because people can be susceptible to that. But we deal with it. 
um, and understand which part of Elizabeth's immune system is not working properly. And she probably has B cells that are not producing antibodies for reasons that we're not quite sure about yet. And we reviewed our vocabulary. So I think that, I think we'll break at that because we're over time. And um, Elizabeth and I will both be up here for a few minutes to answer any other questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.